Welcome back to another episode of That's Business. Today's guest, we have a repeat guest, Kamara Mayberry, who, if you've listened to her first episode, was an absolute powerhouse and just... I can't even read her whole bio because it is just every single thing she dips her toes into and is just (laughs) such a feel good person. Top 10 trending podcasts still to date. Thank you. And we're going to see. We're going to see if this one outperforms your first one. I feel like it will. Because I'm really excited for this topic. Me too. We're going to talk about, you said it best, when all hell breaks loose. Yes. Basically, when Murphy's Law happens and the bottom falls out and all of your best laid strategies and plans for your personal and professional life blows up. What's next? How do you navigate the pivot? How do you navigate what I'm going to call, it's a form of shame, where you feel like you're on one level and all of a sudden you can't maintain that because you have all of these factors that are 100% out of your control. So I can't be all things to everyone because I have to focus 100% on myself and the S show that has become my life in some instances. So let's talk about it. So before we started recording, we had talked about because I I messed up our schedule. I moved us and you were like, girl, preach like it's OK. You could do it with me of all exactly. people. Like, Thank you. But talking about that person, because I have had a hard time. I used to be a type A person. I used to right. be very detailed of I have my to do list and I did my to do list every day and my life I cleaned every day, but that's gone. Right. So talk to us on what's been going on in your world, what you feel comfortable with and catch us up to speed. And then because you had shared that and how she's coming back and the bottom dropped out. <laughs> so, yes, yeah, she she's making a, a, an appearance. And I do want to say this in all seriousness. I want this. I want to say that there is a trigger warning because I will be speaking about grief, bereavement and loss. Uh, That will not be the totality of our conversation, but that is a launching point for what road we need to go down. On September 5th of 2023, uh, my life shattered into pieces that I still have not recovered and will never be able to find. I lost my dad. Um, I was a daddy's girl. I am a daddy's girl. We'll always be a daddy's girl. I adored him and he adored me. And I am one of those folks who got the call at work. Um, I had just talked to my dad the day before and I got a call. I was in a meeting. At the time, I had two cell phones, my business cell phone and my personal cell phone. And I took my business cell phone into the meeting and left my personal cell phone in my office down the hall. So my mom never calls me during business hours unless it's something urgent or emergent. She's just old school where I don't want to bother you at work. I don't want to be a burden. I'll talk to you when you get off work. So anytime I get a call from her during the day, I know something is urgent or time sensitive. Uh, And so when I got back to my office, I had about 15 missed calls from her. (sighs) And this was early afternoon. I knew something was wrong. And frankly, I thought it was another family member. My uh, grandmother was 98 at the time and had been recovering from a stroke. So when I got those missed calls, my initial thoughts were, oh, no, it's Big Mama. That's what we call my grandmother. Um, But when I dialed my mom back, two words, he's gone. Oh my God. I hit the floor. Um, I replay this moment time and time again. Um, I, I don't remember this. Someone told me this, that I screamed. They had never heard a blood curdling scream the way they heard. Everybody rushed to my office because they couldn't imagine what had happened. And of course, I couldn't say anything. So they took the phone, talked to my mom. My mom told them this is what has happened. I couldn't talk. I couldn't do anything. And so at the time, um, one of my VPs said, who can I call? What can we do? And I told them, please call my husband, who is a teacher in the Detroit public school system. He is not available during the day. He is in the classroom. Uh, And so he knew when he got a call from someone other than me, During the day, something had happened. It just happened to be uh, he was available and was sitting in his office doing something. Uh, And so he immediately came to pick me up from work. I couldn't drive. I couldn't talk. I was scrambling to get a flight because I knew if I had to walk on glass, 
I was going to be in Arkansas, which is where my family lives the next day, period. I don't care how much it costs. I didn't care what I had to do. Uh, it was God paving the way because I got a very reasonably priced ticket. Oh, I mean, like, there's no way you would have gotten a ticket for the price I got and flew out the next day. And so, of course, uh, I am the oldest of five. And so it was on me to be a support for my mom who had been with my dad since she was 19 years old. He was it. They had been married over 52 years. Partners in everything. I mean, they're the couple like, you know, get a room. You know, right. we don't want to see that. You're too lovey-dovey. That's what some people would say. But they, you could see and feel the genuine love around them. And so my mom was lost. She did not know what to do. And she knew she couldn't do the planning. So long story short, I was responsible for doing all of the planning for the funeral arrangements. And so that took a toll on me because I had to be strong. I've always been the strong one. But when you have to support an entire family, my siblings, my children, Everybody that surrounds the family was depending on me to make everything work when all I wanted to do was crawl in a corner and disappear. I didn't want to talk to anybody. I didn't want anybody to text me, call me, email me, smoke signals, nothing. I did not want to be available to anyone, but during that time frame, I had to be. Uh, and so I will say to this day, that was the hardest week of my life. It really was. And I am still processing because to a certain extent, I'm still the go-to person. I am still the person that is holding up everyone else. And I really have not had that. I've had my little bitty breakdowns. Uh, I still feel the wave that I know is somewhere on the horizon. So that's the starting point I wanted for this conversation. When you have loss, and if it's the loss of a loved one or if it's the loss of a job, because I will also say two months after that, I had an unexpected job change. So dealing with the loss of my dad, grieving, and then having to look for another position unexpectedly, uh, which a lot of people don't know that because I don't broadcast my business, but I think it's poignant to tell people things happen. I don't care how many degrees you have, how many credentials, how many years in your field or your industry, who you know, because I know a whole lot of people. I have a network that spans from coast to coast. So, you know, in theory... Getting another position shouldn't be difficult at all, right? Because I've helped thousands of people over the years. If I go back to the beginning of my career till now. And so I'm navigating the loss of a career choice. I'm getting navigating the loss of my dad. Um, that was in September. In December, my husband's car was stolen off of the school parking lot. This is a true story. Who did you make mad in another life? Like what? I don't know. I'm thinking, is this karma because I feel like I have, you know, the universe. Uh, I heard someone say recently that the universe has a banking system. And if you're, you're giving deposits, then at some point you can pull on those deposits. So if you're making good deposits, you've got that built up when you need a withdrawal. And so I felt like, hey, I've got a lot of deposits. I'm good. My karma should be good. This is a true story. The Friday before Christmas, John's car was stolen off of the school parking lot. They literally bashed his windows in on camera and took his car. I'm in Arkansas. Oh, my. God. Spending the holiday with my family because it's the first holiday season without my dad. So anyone who knows John, we are 100 percent opposites. I am type A on 10, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. John is, OK, it's good. <laughs> Not this. Uh, hey, we can work it out. He it's is time. He's zen. So when he calls me and just says, "Not sure. Oh, by the way, walked out at the end of the day. The car was stolen. <laughs> I'm hitting the ceiling because of his notification of his car being stolen. They did find the car. These people were using it as uh, basically a work vehicle. They had put had there was a water heater tank in there, tools. I mean, this is a, a bizarre story. But long story short, we navigated that. He had to have a rental car for a month. Then our son had a, a wreck on New Year's Eve. Totaled his little hoopty. Now, remember, that this is the hoopty. I think I talked about this in the previous podcast. This was the iteration, the third person who had driven yes. this car. Okay, this is the hoopty that never dies, right? <laughs> R.I.P. So this is what <laughs> September, December, it was... The S show of the century. Everything that possibly could go wrong with us did. And so I sat still, like you said, and wondered what the heck has happened for the bottom to fall out? Because when all of my friends and family and colleagues were going through the worst time during the height of COVID, 
we coasted through it. In fact, we came out of COVID more financially solvent, closer as a couple, closer as a family, everything about our lives navigating COVID made us stronger, better. So it almost feel like the drama and the chaos we didn't have to deal with sort of was lurking in the corner and came back with a vengeance. So when you're navigating those kinds of losses that just hit upon hit upon hit, the first thing you want to do is turn to your family and friends, right? Your support system. Who are those people who can help me navigate? Hey, we're dealing with A, B, or C. We need some support on this or that. Well, you're leaning into your network, and that's your family network, that's your friend network, that's your supporters. And you find out very quickly who is for you and who isn't. Because when the ask is flipped, they're very quick to call you, text you, email you when they need something from you. And whatever the something is, they want you to connect them to an opportunity, to money, to a person, to a job. Whatever the ask is, they're very quick on prompt, you know, follow up. When you turn around and say, hey, we need a contact at the police department because John can't get in contact with the detective who signs the paperwork to release the vehicle to the insurance company. So that was another week of heck trying to get that taken care of. So I'm like, hey, isn't your husband in law enforcement? Don't you know somebody there? So at that point, I couldn't depend on anybody else. Mm -mm. Nobody was available to help me. So for those folks in the audience who are spiritual, that's when I had to pull on my higher power because it was me and him. It was God. And I had to get on my hands and knees and pray and cry out and say, I need help. I'm about to lose it. And sis, when I say lose it, I mean it in every sense of the word. And for people who know me, know me, they would never even dream that those words will come out of my mouth because I'm, I, I can handle it. Anything that comes my way, it's handled. I can pivot and have pivoted throughout my entire life. Um, but this pivot was difficult because I was not at my 100% self. The Kimara before September 5th at 1.32 p.m. is no longer because that was when my dad was here. So from 1.33 on that day, I'm somebody else. And I don't even know who she is yet. Looking back on losses and what we've talked about kind of briefly touching into is I'm, you know, moving through them and whatnot, but it's great to realize who's there for you and who's yes. not. And it's kind of like a nice clean house. Right. And I actually just went to a, my friend put on an event about sisterhood and who's in your circle or who are your shadow friends. Exactly. And I'm feeling that. Oh, I love that. Shadow friends who are lurking in the shadows. Right? Exactly. It's like, okay, who needs to step out of the shadows into your circle and be a part of your light? Exactly. I loved it. It was really impactful, but it's like the timing is so right on this podcast because I'm like, I had this conversation and you reaching back out was perfect. But thinking about when you are the firstborn, when you have yes. your own consultancy, you work full time, you have exactly. an incredible family, like you are the relied upon person all the time. But it's That's like, right. who is there for... And I don't want to compare apples and oranges because you have your shit together way more than I do. But oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> well, maybe you put it on better than me. How about that? We'll do there that. You go. <laughs> but who's there for us or who's there? Can I just melt in outside of just our partners? Because I know John's incredible. Yes, he My is. partner, Dan's incredible. But it's like, OK, it's not their sole responsibility to do it all the time. Like who else can help or when, you know, exactly. it's John's car or whatever situation to help your family. Exactly. People need to be there. Right. I just wanted to throw that in there because that's been something like I've been going through a lot and so thankful for our relationship, but it's like, okay, some of those friends like are in the shadows and they're going to stay there forever and pulling right. more people into that circle. Exactly. So transitioning into, you know, you're at your, we'll just say lowest point and just yes. like, where the hell do I turn? What do I do? Exactly. Going into that higher power. And I love this term of higher power and whatever you believe, if that is a That's God, right. if it That's is, right. you know, an energy or whatever you believe in, but this is something talked about so much. So for you, what was that like giving up control and saying, Hey, I'm done. Like I'm wiping my hands of this. I've done all that I can. 
what was that kind of like for you being that type A person? Because you are the like, I think I called you Olivia Pope on the last you podcast. Did. And I'm like, you, you are Olivia Pope. It's handled. You said it. You said it. it's handled. It's handled. And I am the person that people bring problems and issues and challenges to, to help them strategize. How do I navigate this? So when you're turning that on yourself, and I feel like I am in control of my destiny, I have carefully curated my journey based on all the things that have happened to me, because I feel like I've learned from every landmine in my life and every situation that I had no control over. You know, I've, I've said previously, I'm a, a domestic violence survivor. I'm not a victim. I'm a survivor. And that has informed my journey in a tremendous way. But when you're giving up control, because we never had control, in my opinion, in my journey with my higher power, we never had control. I think sometimes we are delusional and think we are curating our own steps and I'm doing this and nobody, there's nothing in the atmosphere. There's nothing in the spiritual realm helping me. I'm doing this solo. I think that God will humble you very quickly. And I don't believe uh, when people say that, you know, God gives you negative issues and things in your life. I don't believe that. I believe he will allow things to happen, to grow you and to build you into something that can then execute his will for your life. I don't feel like my dad, when I hear people say stuff like, oh, they needed them in heaven more than he needed to be here, or God makes no mistakes. I wish someone would please give basically a grief tutorial because people say the dumbest things that don't help whatsoever. No, I think in their minds, they think they're, and I, I would basically, I would just encourage the audience Just give someone a hug and just say, I don't know what to say, but I love you. That's it. Those words mean everything. I don't want the diatribe or the script or the things because you sound totally silly and you don't know my journey, but I digress. (laughs) Um, But for me, it was I had to understand I have no control over this. I have no control over um, my dad's passing away. No control over the job situation. No control over John's car getting stolen. All the bad things that were swirling around within three months. This is not sort of a spaced out, oh, it happened here in six months. No, this stuff was happening within weeks of each other. And I had to throw my hands up and say, I don't know what to do. The person who literally always knows what to do, I had nothing. And at that moment, I had an epiphany. And when I just opened myself up to what God wanted to do and needed to do in me, that's when I was able to get some clarity because I walked around in a fog for weeks. I had no focus. I could not think through anything. Some days I could barely get my feet on the floor to wake up. And that's the God honest truth. I mean, anybody knows me, that is the total opposite. Um, grief, Grief is a funny thing because it's always there in the background. The way I described it to someone the other day was, it's like you're in a, a roller coaster car. And so you're always in it. You're always at the gate. Um, You never know when that bar is going to come down on your waist and you're going to lurch forward and go down the roller coaster. You never know what's going to trigger that. So at all times, I'm in the roller coaster. Sometimes it might be a good day or a better day where it may not move. I'm just there. And some days I'm on that roller coaster all day long. And so you have no control over it. That's the thing. The person who has to be in control of everything, I have no control because I don't know what the triggers are. I think as you navigate your grief journey, you get a better sense of what might take you down the rabbit hole. Uh, I'm still learning that. You know, I never know when Facebook is going to come up with the memory that takes me down the rabbit oh, hole. The worst. And so even when I have gone in there and it does give you the option to put in dates that you know are going to be triggered. So holidays and stuff like that, I've done that, but they're random posts that come up down the rabbit hole I go. So I think for those of us who truly pride ourselves in very much being in control of our lives and our destiny and what happens from day to day, both personally and professionally, you have to understand you don't have any control. God gives you my God. And again, this is my relationship for those who have a higher power. There is a semblance of navigation that you are allowed because you have a mind, you have a connection to the spirit, that spirit will guide you is what I have learned and what my journey is. I think for me, that relationship has been strengthened and it has been tightened because I think I let the tether go. 
I think I was sort of like in space, in the space suit, and I had the tether to my higher power. So I knew he's there, but I'm all the way over here. I'm connected, but I'm still doing my own thing. Well, no, we're like this now. We're lockstep. And everything I do, I'm thinking, what does he want me to do? What should I be doing? And John and I were talking today. What are we supposed to be learning in this moment? Ooh, I like that. Because this has to be a learning curve. Because the other thing that's happened is this, our family church. His father preached in his church, because John is also a minister, ordained minister, for decades, probably 50 years before he passed away. And then John took over the church. Well, COVID reduced the church's numbers. We have a lot of online presence, but there's not a whole lot of physical presence. So there's some thoughts about what's next for the church. And for John, it's a very emotional time frame because he literally grew up from nine years old in that church. And that's the connection to his dad. You know, so even thinking about that, because it's a time frame of change for us as a couple, as individuals, as partners, as what we're doing individually and collectively. So if we don't figure out what we're supposed to be learning, I do feel like the universe is going to circle back. Well, you didn't learn that lesson. So, you know, here's some more stuff. (laughs) Right. Let's let's see what you can do with this. Uh, That's really, for me, it was an epiphany because if I did not acknowledge not having control, I would have probably had some really severe mental health issues. And when you face such a big loss, like being a daddy's girl and having that strong relationship, my family has a very healthy relationship with death and the afterlife and everything that makes a lot of people uncomfortable. Right. And it does make a big difference. I mean, shoot, my friend, it took her 17 years because she lost her dad very young, very, very young. Not that I'm saying it's going to take you 17 years, hopefully not, but it's still like it. She's like, it comes in waves. You know, I finally went and visited his gravesite for the third time in my life and I was happy. I didn't cry finally, but I think a lot of people want you to kind of just like, well, you're fine. You have your life together, like move on on to the next one. I've actually heard that. In fact, somebody (gasps) in my life who will remain nameless and I will not state what capacity they were in my life. Mm -hmm. I was told these words. I gave you a pass when your father died. Someone told me that. Well, I gave you a pass. So basically, in in essence, you've had enough time. It hasn't even been. Oh, I just want to go burn things down. You've had enough time. So basically what I want to need you to do, you need to get it done because I'm dictating to you when your grief is over. (laughs) These are the things that people put out in the universe. Mm -hmm. So it goes back to who's in your circle. And that's professionally as well. Yes. As I move forward and understand what I want to do next and how this period of time informs my decisions, I know for an absolute fact, I will not accept anything less than a supportive work environment that lifts me up and gives me space to be a human being. And we talked about that before on toxic work environments. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is this, and this is probably another podcast, not with me, but maybe someone else. But the job search process is so toxic, Angela, at this point. Awful. It's been a minute for me. So when I see all these posts on LinkedIn about people having these absolutely horrendous recruiting nightmares. Mm -hmm. I thought these people cannot be the face of any organization trying to encourage someone to come into the fold because if they're doing the absolute opposite, not only are you a horrible face for the organization, I am going to sing it from the rooftops. The horrendous experience I had. It's just, you know, I I don't know if I thought people were being dramatic or they're just trying to click into the algorithms on LinkedIn because I think all of those posts are getting a lot of traction now. They do, right. Mm -hmm. But it's real. And that's the other thing. I'm going to encourage people jumping through five, six, seven hoops, six or seven interviews for a non-C-suite position or they want you to do some task or project that you're not getting paid for No, absolutely not. It's a hard no. Yep. 
I will not parade myself in for two panel interviews, you know, basically the screening call, then the virtual, then two panel. And then we want to try you in one time to just have a conversation no. with the high level decision maker. No. In fact, I told someone, you know what? Thank you. I am opting out of this process. <laughs> and I said, and I would love for you to send me a link to give my thoughts. I said, you can do that or I can put it out on all of my platforms. I said, because I definitely want to give feedback to your decision makers, because I'm fairly certain they have no idea how toxic you are. No, it's crazy. The amount of clients that have reached back out and they're all we worked with 2021, 2022. Right. They're like, Angela, what am I doing wrong? Like, I got a exactly. job so quick. Like, you're, I know, like all the advice you gave me work. Like, what am I doing wrong now? I added right. the position you updated. Like, what is going wrong? And I'm exactly. like, it's out of control. And I think that also adds to the stress I'm facing because not to, I'm going to make it self-centered. No mean to be, but it's like, you're so great. I wish I could hire you. Like all these great people and these processes are trash. They are so dysfunctional and so toxic. And you wonder, is there an intentionality there? Right. Where they want to, quote unquote, weed out the folks who are not, you know, they're looky-loos. They really don't want the job. This is job application, 250, not in their industry. They have no experience related to this role. They're just putting in applications willy-nilly. Are they trying to weed that person out? I'm not sure. I would love to hear from some real recruiters mm -hmm. on, you know, what is it? Because you hear all of the, and you know, you've been there and you've recruited for Fortune 500, Fortune 100 companies. What is it from then to now where I know so many people that, like you say, are outstanding candidates for any role for any company. You know, we talked about the crosswalk. So don't talk to me about they don't have experience in this industry. They absolutely can do the job. It's so frustrating. And there are people who have just given up on the process. That adds to the mental health aspect of the job search because you always feel, you already feel like if you are emotionally tied to and intellectually tied to who you are professionally and that cracks that goes up in flames well who am I am I not a value now because this recruiter says I'm not this process says I'm not right and I think what happened when people were looking at layoffs and everything first go were recruiters yes talent acquisition I mean 100% I think that's one of the many issues I think all the good people leave because they're sick of the bullshit and they're like I can't right. do anything else and they're out I've helped many many people in HR and recruiting look for new jobs which is yes devastating myself I'm like yep mm -hmm. okay that company's going down okay stay away from there right and these leaders that are getting promoted and I'm trying to make words to this because I feel like we're retracting back into time where we are we're seeing a lot of like the old boys club is coming back yes and it's I feel like more prominent more than ever I 100% agree with you and I wonder for the impactful female leaders who were empowered during the height of COVID, because it wasn't only just from an HR perspective. For those listeners who don't know me, I have a vast HR background and HR practitioner and leader. When we were elevated during the height of COVID, it was something we had not seen. It was unprecedented, the access that we had to executive leadership and those who were elevated to C-suite roles where they were previously an HR manager. But you know what? We see your value. We're going to even bypass the director role. You're now a VP. Those roles have disappeared. Mm -hmm. They have restructured. I could probably name 10 names right now of people who were in C-suite roles right after COVID that either their position has been eliminated or they have restructured, bumped them back down uh, to lower level management or leadership roles or even lower than that. And to your point, why? What in the environment has allowed old boys club to resurface it never went away no of course not mm -hmm. but let me be clear to everyone thinks well you must <laughs> must be pie in the sky you must be 100 percent naive girl no listen i understand it never went away but we had made some very definitive headway yeah. where our face was in the place we were decision makers we were given the autonomy to build our teams and to build our organizational divisions in the way that we felt would 
100% bring value to the company. Why is that not happening now? That's a conversation. And I don't think it's being had. It's not. And I think during a lot of acquisitions or that's um, one of what are we on issue number five of this conversation. (laughs) But I think during these acquisitions, they're just like, oh, we're just going to merge together. It's fine. This company is getting acquired. I don't know. It's fine. Don't care. Exactly. I've seen a lot of great people get out of HR that cl- that is there to help people and make sure people are supported, which is what HR is in its essence should have been. That is what we are. Yes. But then they're coming in and hiring people from these old boys clubs. And this is Correct. not, if you're listening to, and I don't feel like any of my listeners, dis- I don't want to say disagree, but This is not just a conversation I'm having with women. No, it's not. Men are coming to me. I mean, millennials, anyone under the age of, I would say, 55 maybe or 20, 30, 40 somethings coming to me saying, I am not a part of the old boys club. And even actually people that would technically be a part of it are saying, like, I'm not a part of the in-group. Right. I'm out. I'm getting out. Like, I can't do anything. I'm losing sleep. I'm losing hair. I'm losing my health. It's not worth it. I can't do it anymore. Yep. And that's what they're doing. They're saying, I'm out. A lot of them are retiring early. A lot of them are um, changing to an industry that they never would have dreamed of. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you talk about the and I've in fact, I've been on a couple of panels that will come out in a few weeks talking about the change of the structure of the work environment. And in fact, those of you know, I'm a president of Detroit Sherm. We've got a panel coming up in November where we're going to be talking to emerging professionals and uh, Gen Z because the stats are very uh, startling in the sense that we're not ready as employers. 75%, listen to that, 75% of your workforce is going to be Gen Z by the end of 2025. That's crazy. 75%. Are we ready? The answer is no, because Gen Z has a very definitive lens uh, and they're not going for the okie doke, period. They know what they want. They know what they bring to the table. You better provide flexibility. You better be very serious as it relates to your diversity efforts and initiatives. Uh, And they're not just going to bow down because they're going to go somewhere else if you don't offer what it is they need. Uh, And so we're going to be talking about that. But these are the things that I don't think employers are ready for. And if you feel like going back to the Stone Ages, to the old boys network, and let's just keep it real, that's old white men. Mm -hmm. And those of you who don't know, I am an African-American female. And so that is real. People don't want to hear that. Oh, you're pulling the race card. That's not true. It's 100 percent true. It is. And if we don't talk about it and if we don't talk about strategies to um, really neutralize that effort, we're going to be in 2025 and back in 1980. And that's the reality. Right. Yes. I mean, I am so blessed. I've been surrounded with badass women my whole life. But yes, me too. (laughs) Even just like. The behaviors, the comments here and there that you're like, haha, yeah, funny, cool, because you're a young 20 something year old and just like exactly a corporate job. Like, no, this is this is what DEI is. And exactly. It's so annoying and it's so frustrating when people say, like, oh, you're playing the race card and this. Playing the race card. Nobody wants, nobody wants to be hired just because of their color of their skin or just correct. Let's be clear on that. Cause I, I love fighting with people on this and it's You know, it was not too long ago that someone's like, oh, the race card there. "Mm -hmm, Let's talk about that. You know what? If you post that and watch them duke it out in the comments, it's magical. Oh, it's so fun. Get you a cup of coffee and read the comments because people truly are activated (laughs) when you talk about (laughs) DEI, the race card. What are we doing next? Um, they duke it out in the comments and I think it's hilarious because most of them are totally ignorant of the issue Mm -hmm. and everybody's a philosopher and and a content expert at this point. We could talk about that as well. But, you know, from a human resources perspective, there are companies that are still focused on inclusion and belonging and what do they need to do to be a welcoming and supportive place for all. I don't know what organization would not want that moniker. Right. Why would you not want to be that to your current employees and anyone who you are recruiting in to your organization? And if you have, you know, people, supporters, stakeholders who do not have that value, why are you connected to them? You can always say, you know what? Back then we didn't speak up. We let you say those very toxic and inappropriate 
things in leadership meetings. We're not taking that anymore. So if you can't make a change, you're out. Because the fear factor is what needs to be addressed. Because why? To your point, why aren't you saying something? Why aren't you speaking up? Why aren't you saying this is unacceptable? I don't know. Right. Uh, what What are you afraid of? Mm-hmm. Success? Because that's what you're pushing away if you don't. <sighs> And I think, too, a lot of people, I mean, it's expensive as hell to be an adult right now, but everything raising up in price. And I think a lot of people are staying in these positions or just they're trying to get out. They're trying to, but these process making it difficult. And then one question I keep getting asked, and I'm working with Wayne State right now with uh, current students, and they're like, why do they ask, like, what background I'm in? Like, do I have to answer that? Do I, like, what color, like, what um, ethnicity I am. And I'm like, that's a very good point. And a lot of, and you could speak to this because you are the HR expert, not me, of course, but talking through (laughs) some of these processes that ask very intimate details. They do. Oh, this is for our, our diversity. Like we're, we're DEI forward. And I'm like, you can't like, no, let me be 100% transparent and real. A lot of that is so that they can understand what your background is and then they know what their biases are. And it's a way to screen. It's a way to screen out who they don't want. Because they will say, even on uh, applications, all of those questions are optional. There are some companies who are required to report that out because, for example, it's part of a federal contract. You must have X, Y, Z. Are you required to have that on an application? And then you say, oh, it's not a deciding factor. Yes, it is. You are using it as a deciding factor. So that's why they say it's optional. But then you get an email two minutes later. Oh, we invite you to participate in this survey. We invite you. But it's optional. It won't be used. It won't even be attached to your application, which is all BS. It's all in the same HRIS system. We can talk about that as well. People need to understand that nobody's really reading your resume. It most definitely is going through an HRS system and you're getting kicked out of the queue. And so they can absolutely refuse to answer that question on an application. I don't care how many times they get the magical email of, oh, did you forget to answer these questions that can be used to discriminate against you? Mm -hmm. Now, the other thing is this, if they do have a disability and it will ask, do you have a disability? And they know they need accommodations, even for the interview. You absolutely ask that question. And you then follow through by emailing whatever magical email or contacting whoever it is to make sure that they have set up appropriate accommodations for you, for your interview and beyond. So there are some, you know, spaces there where you absolutely need to answer it based on your own individual situation. Yes, but and I, I'm not laughing at this conversation. I'm laughing because you you said the email's perfect word for word, and that's what's making me laugh here. But it's so true. And on this topic, because I want people to know their rights, what are some of those other things you see a lot on job applications, especially or going in the interview process? Because a lot of people don't realize, and if you're from another country or if you've especially Europe where they talk about kids, they talk about family life. And that's like, I'm like, they can't ask you A, B, C, D, E. Do not answer. Illegal question. Do you have dependable transportation? They cannot ask that question. I've even seen applications where they say, oh, you have to live within X amount of miles of the location. No, you don't. You just have to demonstrate that you can get to work by hook or by crook. If I have to get up at three o'clock in the morning and walk to work, I will do that. If I have to take public transportation and I'm transferring five buses, if I'm taking the train or the subway or whatever it is, them asking, do you have dependable transportation? That is not an appropriate question on an application or an interview because it can be used to discriminate against you because now you're going to class because obviously There's going to be more black and brown people who may not have reliable transportation. I don't need to announce that to you during a recruiting process. So these are some people don't know that. That was one of the questions my account manager, I ended up duking it out with verbally, would ask. And he would even ask, like he would ask, and he's like, well, well, part of the old boys club too. Yeah. Now running the company I used to work for. So, wow. you know, not surprised, but. Oh, do you have reliable transportation? Do you right. do this? You know, 
I don't have words, but keep going because I just am like, I'm like, yeah, of course. The other questions now I'm seeing, uh, seeing a lot and people have brought to my attention. Um, do you identify as a sex on your ID? So if I'm a trans applicant and so do I identify as uh, say I'm a, a trans male and so but I have not had the sex reassignment um, or what now it's called the uh, affirmation surgery. And so I am biologically a female and my ID still has female on there. Do I identify as that? No, you can't ask that. That's not an appropriate question. I did not know that's getting asked. Wow. <gasps> yes, it is. Somebody sent me a screenshot. Oh, dear Lord. So they're asking and now they do ask optional. What are your pronouns? How do you identify yourself straight by, you know, they list a mini list of what you could identify as. Again, oh, this is to demonstrate their mm -mm. their forward thinking and this is part of their stats. No, no, it's not. Stop it. Lies. I tell people this too, but I mean, I worked for a defense agency before and I loved it. Right. But any vets we hired were a nice tax credit for us. Right. Or certain status. Like, right. Nope. Mm-mm. Exactly. So there are questions that they ask that, again, people are like if I what happens if I don't if you don't answer, there's nothing they can do legally. They can't. Now, they may what I'm going to call behind the scenes say, oh, they didn't answer this. We need to know if she's a black female or not. If Even for whatever reason, they want to identify me prior to. Now, of course, now they're going to look at look at me on LinkedIn. So even if you don't answer the questions, uh, audience, please understand they're looking at your social media. Yes. So even if I don't answer any of the questions and I don't. Um, mm -hmm. they're going to immediately go to my social media. So then they say, oh, she's a black female. Well, we're not interested in hiring a, a black female because, hey, they've got the angry black woman syndrome. Someone was told that hand to God. Someone, one of my friends was told that in an interview about a month ago that we've had an issue with black women because they're angry and they cause friction and strife in the workplace. They were told this during a face-to-face -face interview, panel interview. Of course, now they're battling with the EEOC. <laughs> she filed a complaint. I think people need to understand you have rights. Mm -hmm. Applicants, you have rights even before you step into a role for that organization. And you absolutely need to call these folks out when you feel like this is a discriminatory recruiting process. And it's happening, Angela, it's happening more than people understand. It is becoming the norm. These are not one off situations. No. There are patterns. Mm -hmm. And I think what it is, is we have a not I don't want to say a rise in social media, but kind of of like you screwed around. Now you're going to find out. And I've had more <laughs> exactly more clients and friends suing very large fortune, probably 100 companies. Absolutely. Because of discrimination based on mental health accommodations based on yes ma'am all these things and now that i mean i people come out and tell me a lot of this of course for doing what i do day to day but right now i'm hearing the verbiage of like oh yeah said company like offered me this severance that i took in 2018 i'm like you were one of those people like listening to the verbiage now i'm like this has been going on forever it's just right. people finally exactly. have the resources to talk some not all still a lot don't but it's crazy. And I, I mean, you scream it from the rooftops. I try to scream it from the rooftops, but absolutely. It's crazy that this is still happening. It's still happening. Um, I believe during the height of COVID, because that's just a pivotal definitive point yes. in the world of work. And it will always be a defining factor of how we did human resources and leadership before and post COVID. And during that time frame, when many organizations and employers were so desperate for talent, they would not dream of doing anything discriminatory because they needed everybody in a seat they could get. And so now they've forgotten mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, about how to attract and retain great talent because that's what we all had to do during the height of COVID. Now they've gone back to, oh, now we're going to be very selective and we're going to be very discriminatory. And because I'm a Fortune 100 company, I am untouchable. No, you're touchable, sir. And we're like you say, we're going to show you. <sighs> yes. No. Mm -mm. It's so frustrating. And a lot of people say or have like said to me like, well, you know, I really need this job. Yes. I'm a single parent. I need the money. I need this. But if I'm looking at people and 
feel free to disagree with me too. If you have to do what you have to do on your resume or I'm interviewing you and you took a job as whatever, a bartender, a server, something that's like quick cash, I never yes. judge. I prefer right. you because those environments are very difficult, but it's you have to do what you have to do, especially with how things. I think a lot of people need to hear that because I've talked many people off and I'm just saying if your mental health and a lot of physical health, of course, yes. actual health is being affected, do what you have to do for your family. I mean, get you out of there. But I want your perspective on that because I think a lot of people like, yeah, Angela, you're saying that because that's your day job. But what are your thoughts on that? If you see someone that maybe transitioned careers or mm -hmm. took a different job that's maybe outside of what their like corporate gig was. For me, and again, I, I still have the same lens I had uh, prior to last year in that if you don't prioritize your own mental health and well-being, no one else is going to. And we have to hold employers accountable for doing that, especially when they're causing the stress, the frustration, the mental health issues, which then turn into physical ailments that then we're having to go to the doctor over and over again. Then you want to penalize us as an employee because we have X amount of dollars in claims. And so we've gone over your magical amount. And so you get called into the comp and benefits person to help explain and understand your claims activities. I mean, the list goes on and again, that's discriminatory as well. But you have to take ownership. This is again in life. I'm not a life coach, but I do coach some folks. Yes. We have to take ownership of our lives. And that's every segment. I can't be a value to myself, let alone anyone else, if I do not have my mental health. And I think, I don't even think I realized this as much during the height of COVID as I do now. My peace is worth a zillion dollars. I can't even put a price on it. I would go to Burger King and make $13 an hour to have peace and well-being. I've made six figures for a Fortune 300 company. And John will tell you, I was the worst wife, the worst mom, stressed out, frustrated, couldn't eat, couldn't sleep, health problems. That was the worst time of my life. And I made the most. I had a corporate card. I had gas reimbursement. I mean, every perk you could have, baby, I had it. <laughs> Period. Right. Had it. Overall, best compensation package I've ever had, including retirement match, the works. And guess what? I left with my hair on fire and said, enough is enough. And you can't enjoy it. You can't enjoy it when you're so stressed. You can't. I did it. I didn't eat. I would come home straight and go to bed. We had money. I didn't even want to go anywhere. Right. So I, I encourage people, prioritize your mental health. And if you need to pivot and do something else for a while, do that. If you need to change industries altogether, there's a season. I've been in human resources for 100 years. <laughs> look really good for a hundred. <laughs> well, thank you, man. I, I told you, and I told John, I feel like maybe it may be a time I, I will be pivoting to something else in the next couple of years. I don't know what that is yet. Maybe it's full-time consulting. Maybe it's not. I'm not sure what that is. I'm open to what the universe has to bring me. I'm not putting myself in a box. You know, I've done ops management. I've done a bunch of other stuff. So I'm not afraid to pivot. The fear factor, and we've talked about this before, is paralyzing. So you have to take care of yourself so that you are very open and you're healthy and you can make healthy choices. So in this environment that we're working in people who, to your point, hey, I'm a single mom. I've been there. I've been a single mom of three and everybody was in every activity you could possibly imagine. And I was robbing Peter to pay Paul. I was riding around on fumes, eating hot dogs and baked beans for lunch because I couldn't afford to go out to lunch with all my coworkers. So it was ramen noodles for me, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Been there. And you have to do what you have to do. I was working two jobs and going to school to finish my undergrad degree. And guess what? I ended up in the ER. I passed out. This is a true story. Passed out in the copy room. I don't remember what happened. Someone found me on the floor. Blood pressure was stroke level. I was severely dehydrated. And the doctor told me, if you don't change your life, somebody, you're going to end up in the morgue. I've been there where you have to make, and I was like, I can't afford to not work two jobs. I have to go to school. I have to increase my earning potential, but I was also killing myself mentally 
and physically. So for those folks who, who are saying, you know what, I'm at my wit's end. I have to do something. Take care of yourself. Have to. If you don't, the problems that you will have on down the road from not prioritizing yourself and for people in your life who don't allow you to do that, I don't care who it is. They have got to go. You have to protect your peace. Now, does it mean that you kick them out of your life forever? I don't know what that means for everybody else. For me, for this season, you're out. Now, we'll reevaluate that at a later time. But for now, this is what I need from you. And if I don't get that, you're gone. You're gone. You're out. The seasons is so important. If you're Seasons. I mean, you change. And this is where I think a lot of people need to realize is you change. And who is changing with you or this concept I'm going to take to uh, from that conference yes, I went to? Who will go to war for you? Who will adapt? Who will do this? Where are you saying a word now? <laughs> who will go to war for you? Mm-hmm. And it's usually a very small number of people. Yes. And it, even if it's somebody that you've gone to war for. Yes. Previously, where you strapped on your battle gear, even when you didn't have the wherewithal or the emotional bandwidth, you went toe to toe with their demons. And that's the other thing. Sometimes we get caught up in other people's whirlwind of their drama (laughs) and allow ourselves to be 100 percent and completely drained. And then we don't have the power for ourselves because I allowed myself or I intentionally stepped into your drama because Greg. I'm down for you like four flat tires. We've been friends since eighth grade. I love that. Yes. And now I don't have the strength to hold myself up because I gave it all to you. And you weren't even worthy of it. And that has been my experience. Not to say that is everyone's experience, but it has been my experience where I've given everybody my heart, soul, blood, sweat, and tears, and they 100% didn't deserve it. And I refused to acknowledge it in that moment, although I knew it. But I allowed them to drain me completely. And then when my storm came up, I couldn't even navigate it. No. I was nowhere near in the universe of being able to navigate my own problems because I'm always there for other people. And that's one of the reasons why when I lost my dad, I wasn't prepared because I was already drained from helping everyone else for being on their battlefield. Right. It's real. It is real. And uh, I feel called out because I'm like, yeah, I agree. But I'm like, yeah, you do the same (laughs) bullshit, Angela, back on your bullshit. But. You know what? But you can recognize. That's the other thing. Yes. It's not too late to recognize, oh, gosh, I'm doing it again. Mm -hmm. But you also need to acknowledge it to the other person. I can be working on myself and doing my work for myself. And for a lot of people, including me, that means going to a mental health clinician, someone who can give me tools and strategies and build up my toolbox Because I can't do it on my own. I need somebody who is a professional who can help me navigate that. Now, other people might be able to do it on their own. It could be a minister. It could be a Christian counselor, whatever works for you. Some people, you need a professional to help you navigate that. And there's nothing wrong with that. And I think it doesn't carry as much stigma as it used to. But in the black community, I can only speak from that perspective. There has always been a stigma acknowledging mental health problems uh, and getting support and help because we're supposed to be strong. We carry the world on our backs, especially as black women. We've saved the world over and over again. And we're expected to do that. Black women are expected to be strong and to deal with everything head on, you know, no breaks. But we need to understand, recognize your needs and recognize when you can't give to other people because you can't give to yourself because people will use you up they will drain you 100% and not think a thing about it. Mm -mm. They won't. Now, we have to keep this conversation going, but it's going to cut us off at an hour. So (laughs) (laughs) I'm like looking at the time. I'm like, oh, my God. So we're going to keep this conversation going. I don't know in what capacity, but we're going to keep this going. So as we wrap this up. What advice do you have for listeners outside of the incredible amount of advice you've given everyone? (laughs) Um, I will backtrack to the beginning. What do you do when your life blows up? You take a moment and you put that oxygen mask on yourself. Block out all of the distractions. Block out the people that are draining you. Really assess your circle, family, friends, supporters, stakeholders. Assess with a very very clear lens and get rid of those people who are not supporting you in that moment because 
you need to be able to be laser focused and connect to your higher power. Even if you feel like you don't have one, most people feel like something in the universe is keeping things going. So what is that for you? Tap into it and get help and support. It's out there. The help is there. It's available. Don't be afraid. Don't be fearful. Don't be embarrassed, ashamed or humiliated. Look at me. I'm navigating a new normal and I have been very vulnerable. In fact, Angela is probably the first person who's heard some of this um, because I just don't broadcast my business on social media. But I want it to be helpful and impactful for those people who know me as the boss babe that I am. I also have problems just like everyone else. (laughs) So that would be my closing moment. Advice. Samara, I could not. I I I was like, there's no way you're gonna top the first podcast, but <laughs> woo. Thank you all for tuning in and head to the show notes to listen to Kamara's first episode. Follow her on social media, see the badass that she is, and tune in again next week for another episode of That's Business.